Terrorist attack killing hundreds has been reported by the Associated Press. London, England, which you ain't safe no place. I don't know what's going on. Hijackings and bombings. What's the difference? God don't care. God does. God, look out! <laughs> Idiot, you want to kill me? Killing. I don't know what's happening in the world. Look, the Mexican earthquake. 20,000 dead. My Lord. My Lord God, nothing. Where is God? The Holocaust. Where was God when they were butchering innocent people? In 39 already. Everybody knew that those who disappeared suddenly would not come back alive. Jesu ufam tobia. Jesus, I trust in you. The story of the prisoner's escape was true, though escape is not the point. Jesus, I trust in you. St. Augustine said, Your Christ, O oh God, is your mercy. And the references to mercy in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, have influenced the world's greatest literature. 400 years ago in The Merchant of Venice, William Shakespeare said, the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. And Thomas Merton, 20th century's most widely known monk, said that mercy is the key to transforming a whole world in which sin seems to hold sway. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas went so far as to call mercy the greatest of all God's attributes. The same is found in this diary. Faustina Kowalska, the young woman who wrote it, never had time to read Augustine or Aquinas. In fact, she had less than a grade school education. But a growing number of people today will tell you that the message in this diary changed their lives forever. Divine mercy in my soul. 
This book may appear to be simply the intimate account of one woman's spiritual journey, not unlike the writings of Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena, and Therese of Lisieux. But what accounts for the comfort it's brought to thousands during World War II? And what accounts for the rapid worldwide acceptance of this message and the devotion it inspired? Yet suddenly, in 1958, all this was banned by the Vatican. It seems that any worthwhile thing has to be tested. This test lasted 20 years. The essential question being the credibility of the author. That credibility was established after 10 years of intense investigation, initiated by Cardinal Vortiwa. In 1978, his efforts succeeded. The ban was lifted, and the message of the Divine Mercy began to spread with even greater vigor than before. Six months later, that Cardinal became Pope. What is the message that this young woman offers to the world? And what can it mean to you and me? I'm Helen Hayes, and that's what you and I are going to explore. Helena Kowalska was born on August 25th, 1905, in a poor agricultural region close to the heart of Poland. Small farms surround the shabby village of Zwinitze Wielkie. Little has changed here over the years. People still live and work in very much the same way they did when Helena was born. This little girl today could be Helena, doing her chores many years ago. She came from a large family, although they were very poor, and only three winters of formal schooling had been available to her. Helena had a rich spiritual upbringing. When she was very small, her father had taught her to read from the Bible and from a small collection of books about missionaries and monks. She was an unusual child. Unusual because at a very early age, she spent so much of her time in devotion and prayer. At the very beginning of her diary, Helena recalls vividly that when she was seven years old, she heard God's voice calling her to the life that she had read about in those books on missionaries and monks. World War I freed Poland from the political and religious suppression of the Russian Tsar. <laughs> Helena had already worked for several years as a domestic servant. Her parents still wouldn't hear of her insistence to become a nun. So Helena continued as a servant from the country at the better homes in town. shall I put up with you? And how long will you keep putting me off?
have to let me know what I should do next. Go to Warsaw at once. There you will enter a convent. Elena was alone in Warsaw. There wasn't anyone she knew who could help her. At last, her faith led her to the convent of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy, where she was accepted into the congregation on August 1st, 1925. At the novitiate near Krakow, Elena began her training in religious life. When she received her habit, she also received her religious name, Sister Maria Faustina. At the very moment the nuns first dressed her in the coronet, God revealed clearly what this commitment would demand of her. Two years of intense spiritual experiences, Sister Faustina took her place among the professed sisters. She became a particular blessing to her superiors. Because of her ready and agreeable nature, they were able to send her wherever and whenever a need arose. <laughs> For a long time, the superiors and many of the sisters were unaware of her chronic tubercular condition. <coughs> Over the years, the condition grew worse. <coughs> but Faustina willingly completed all their demanding assignments. God's plan, all this perfected her trusting faith and obedience, a faith and obedience necessary for a mission far more demanding. In the evening, when I was in my cell, I saw the Lord Jesus dressed in a white robe. There were red and pale rays emanating from the area of his heart. And I heard Jesus say, Paint an image according to the pattern you see, and sign it, Jesus, I trust in you. At her shrine in Częstochowa, Mary, the mother of Jesus, 
showed Sister Faustina just how much she cares for all of us. about God's mercy toward people, for I gave the Savior to the world. As for you, you have to speak to the world about His great mercy and prepare the world for His coming again. Sister Faustina was unaware that she had spent over five hours in prayer that day before the miraculous image of Our Lady. She nearly missed the train that took her to the new assignment as gardener at the convent in Vilno. Sister Faustina was happy here in her work and in her life of prayer. Here she met Father Mikhail Zapochko. There was no doubt this was the priest whom Christ had promised to send her. He would become her spiritual director and her friend. Faustina confided her mission and her life. A life that was chosen by God to spread the message of divine mercy throughout the world. Father Sopochka responded to Sister Faustina with caution and with great reserve. He had requested that Mother Irenia get an evaluation of the sister's psychological stability. A psychiatrist, Dr. Mary Marchievska, certified that she found no evidence of any abnormal disorders of the nervous system or any mental deviation in Sister Faustina. So, with Mother Irenia's permission, Father Sopochka put Sister Faustina in touch with an artist who painted the image that Christ had demanded of her in the vision. Jesus, who will paint you as you really are? The value of this image is not in the beauty of paint and brush, but in my grace. By means of this image, I shall grant my grace to souls. It is to be a reminder of the demands of my mercy. I'm offering people a vessel with which they are to keep coming for graces to the fountain of mercy. That vessel is this image, which is signed. Jesus, I trust in you. All this 
Faustina confided to her confessor. He was amazed at her profound understanding of divine truths. Her ability to discuss them with the expertise of a theologian made him realize that she was indeed an extraordinary person. However, because she took so much of his time, Father Sopochka instructed Faustina to start a detailed diary. The prospect of translating intimate conversations with Jesus into hard words on paper terrified her. After all, she hadn't written anything in a notebook since her meager schooling many years ago. Right of my mercy, to write about my greatest mystery and to encourage souls to trust in me is now the task of your entire life. Jesus, transform me completely into your mercy to be your living reflection. May your unfathomable mercy pass to my neighbor through my heart, through my tongue, and through my hands. My daughter, the flames of my mercy demand that I spend them. I want to pour them out upon all people. My Lord, your goodness encourages me to speak with you. Your words throw light on my mind so that I can know you more and more deeply. Secretary of my most profound mystery, your task is to write down everything that I make known to you about my mercy so that all who read these things will be comforted in their souls and will have the courage to approach me. I therefore want you to devote all your free moments to writing. My Jesus, you see that I don't know how to write well. And on top of that, I haven't even got a good pen. Often it scratches so badly that I must put sentences together letter by letter. And that isn't all. I also have the difficulty of keeping secret from the sisters the things I write down. I write with the permission of my superiors and also at the command of my confessor. So often I have to shut my notebook every few minutes because of an interruption and then the time set aside for writing is gone. From the beginning to the end of her diary, Sister Faustina wrote the equivalent of 600 printed pages. She wrote decidedly and finally, with few corrections or erasures. This was a work of faith, but Faustina knew that even the strongest faith was useless without putting it into action. Word has spread among the poor to go to Sister Faustina if you want to experience dignity and kindness.
Your compassion within the bounds of obedience has pleased me. And this is why I came down from my throne, to taste the fruits of your mercy. Sister Faustina was very ill now. Her tuberculosis was spreading throughout her body. My daughter, encourage souls to pray the chaplet I gave you, by which I am pleased to grant everything they will ask of me. Help me save souls. You will go to a dying sinner, and you will continue to recite the chaplet. In this way, you will obtain for him trust in my mercy, for he is already in despair. found myself in a strange cottage. The man was dying in great torment. All about the bed was his family. They were crying. Suddenly, I saw a multitude of demons. I began to pray, and the spirits of darkness fled, with hissing and threats directed at me. Then the soul of the man became calm and, filled with trust, rested in the Lord. At the hour of death, I defend anyone who prays this chaplet, and anyone who is near death for whom this chaplet is being offered. At the same moment, I found myself again in my own room. How this happens, I do not know. Sister Faustina remained confined to her bed. Her illness was in its final stages. Her sisters were praying the chaplet as part of their devotion. Still, Faustina agonized to complete the sixth and last notebook of her diary. My God, although my sufferings are great and protracted, <coughs> I accept them from your hands as magnificent gifts. Because everything is so much less than your mercy. <coughs> that I know. That is clear to me. Sister Faustina was a true mystic. That means she gave herself willingly to become completely identified with Christ. You see, just as the eternal spirit transformed the humanity of Christ into a saving divine sacrifice by what he suffered, so the more the Holy Spirit transformed Faustina by what she suffered, the more God was able to work through her. I am perfectly aware that my mission does not end with death. It will begin. O oh, doubting souls, for you I will draw aside the veils of heaven to convince you of God's goodness so that you would no longer wound with your distrust the sweetest heart of Jesus. God is love and mercy. Sister Faustina died on October 5th, 1938. As she had foretold her death, she had also foretold the coming of the Second World War.
Within 11 months, German planes crossed the Polish frontier. Each time the sisters went to Faustina's grave to ask for her intercession. As she had foretold, the threats of the invaders were never carried out. Throughout the war, Sister Faustina's message of the Divine Mercy grew. It became an increasing source of strength, especially for all those who were taken to concentration camps. A Marian priest, Father Joseph Yashubovsky, had escaped Nazi execution. He had vowed that if he could join his community in Washington, D.C., he would spread the message of the divine mercy which had been entrusted to him. Siberia. By way of a Japanese freighter, he arrived in America in May 1941. The Felician sisters at Enfield, Connecticut and Plymouth, Michigan helped Father Yashabovsky to publish the message of the Divine Mercy. Here the first copies of the Divine Mercy image, along with the message, were printed and distributed. From the beginning, Krakow has been the capital of the devotion to the Divine Mercy. From the beginning, the archbishops of Krakow have given the devotion their official support. When Cardinal Wojtyła became Pope, his place as Archbishop of Krakow was taken by Francis Cardinal Maharski. I am privileged that my city has perhaps the oldest church ever built in honor of the Divine Mercy. However, we are indebted to Vilno, which is now a city in Lithuania, as the source of the efforts to bring attention to God as mercy and our need to respond to him with trust. It is significant that it was in that city that the first image of Christ's divine mercy with the inscription, Jesus, I trust in you was first seen 
at the shrine of Our Lady of the Gate of the Dawn. It was the Mother of Mercy, as she is lovingly known there, who presented her son as the Divine Mercy to the world. At the time, we needed him most. Holy Father, in the name of all of the congregation of Marians, his father's brothers, his associates, we wish to give you this icon as an expression of our thanksgiving for your proclaiming to the world the message of divine mercy. From the beginning of his ministry in Rome, Pope John Paul II has considered this message his special task. He published it in his second encyclical, Divas in Misericordia, God who is rich in mercy. Sister Beata knew Sister Faustina. In Poland, she welcomes pilgrims from all over the world to the shrine of her fellow sister. For years, Sister Beata has prepared information toward Sister Faustina's canonization. Father George Kosicki heads the Department for the Divine Mercy Devotion on Eden Hill at Stockbridge, Massachusetts. It is from here, more than anywhere else, that the message of the Divine Mercy reached out to people from all over the world. By 1950, prayer cards were being printed in 60 different languages and dialects. printing and publishing going on right here? Yes, and look at the Polish diary here, the diary in French and Brazilian, and we're translating it in many languages, too. And in video. Yes, in video, but listen to this. Three o'clock. It's the hour of mercy. Would you join us at the shrine? Oh, yes, please. Every day at this very hour when Jesus died for us in agony on the cross, we stop, if at all possible, to express our thanks to God for his tremendous act of his mercy. Jesus asked this of Sister Faustina. Asked, he pleaded that she would remember even for a moment. He pleaded. Not only pleaded, he promised whatever we ask, we will receive at that hour. If we ask with trust on the strength of his suffering. Exactly. For all it cost him, he really demands now that we have mercy on him. That's love in the true sense of the word. And it needs to be a two-way street. We so often don't realize that, especially if we only have a nodding relationship with God. Yes, and that's what's so wonderful. Jesus said to Faustina, the more someone needs my mercy, the more I need to give it to him. <laughs> so how can we not trust in him? Divine mercy. You really can't escape it. 